Welcome to another episode of Ask the Experts. I'm your co-host, Jeffrey Walk. And I'm Elizabeth Finlayson. We're from the networking group, TNG, which is Chicago's premier business networking group focused on helping members and making a difference in the communities we serve. Ask the Experts is an effort to share our knowledge with a wider audience. Welcome to another episode of Ask the Experts. In today's episode, we will be discussing the importance of leveling the playing field when bringing claims against large organizations, insurance and government. Our guest today is Barry Silver of Barry Silver Law in Riverwoods, Illinois. Welcome, Barry. Thank you for having me. Barry, thank you for joining us today. So to kick us off, you know, the first question we really have is that the legal process is complex for organizations, and then it can be really overwhelming for individuals. So how do you and your role, how do you guide individuals to determine if they have a valid claim to pursue and how to lay the groundwork for proceeding through the legal process? The vast majority of my practice is personal injury and workers' compensation, which means I'm usually handling a claim for someone who's been injured, either through the negligence of another person, like an automobile accident, or a work injury where they've been injured through uh, fatigue or overwork or something happening at the workplace where they get hurt. It's a complex system, as you know, either way, but we'll stick today with just auto accidents so as not to muddy the waters uh, with the other area of law. So Barry, before clients get started with legal services, are there key questions they should consider before retaining your services? They should look long and hard and say, can I do this myself? And the, really the answer is, and most people agree with this, is no, they can't. The insurance adjuster for, the, for an auto insurance carrier has a caseload of three to 400 cases and has years of experience of handling cases and their job is to resolve the claim for as cheaply as possible. I've said this many times, letting an insurance adjuster deal with the client directly without the services of an attorney is like letting the fox guard the hen house. It's not right and it's not fair. They're not on equal terms. Most people will only have one accident in their lifetime, God willing, the insurance adjuster as I said, handles hundreds of cases a year. So what are some of the mistakes individuals can avoid by upfront preparation? One of the mistakes that I see common is that people don't realize that they're hurt at the scene because of the adrenaline and they don't go to the emergency room right away. And the next day they wake up and they're stiff and sore and they can't turn their neck or they can't bend over to tie their shoes. They should get to the hospital. They have a right to get treated. They have a right to get checked out to make sure nothing terrible is happening to them. I've seen too many cases where people waited to get medical services. And one of the things about that is that insurance companies are run by very cynical people who will say, he didn't get treatment for five days. Sometimes you can't get into a doctor for longer than that, but you can always get into an emergency room. So when there's a delay in treatment, the insurance company takes that as a sign of, it's not really an injury. The guy's just doing it to make money. The other thing that people can do is don't worry about the car, worry about your body. Too many times I have people who are so upset about the car. The car is just metal and rubber and some computer stuff nowadays. It's not your body. You only have one body in this life. You have to take care of it. So how do you guide clients through this legal maze and put them at ease, especially if they're on meds, if they've been injured, they're not thinking straight. You know, there's a lot of emotions tied up in it. Well, I explain to them that they're rights, their right to get treatment. I explain to them how the investigation is going to go. I like to, if, if it's, we're in person and I can show them the map, a Google picture rather, of the intersection or the location where it happens and have them guide me through what they remember how the accident happened and they can help with the investigation. And as I've said before, I believe, sometimes when you go onto the Google map and you see the, the aerial photograph, you can determine whether or not there is video footage of the accident, which I've seen many times in my career 
where we actually have the accident on tape, which is a very helpful improving who's at fault, or as we call it, liable, who's liable. The other thing is we tell them they've got to get themselves checked out. They usually, when they go to the emergency room, the, the emergency room will refer them to a doctor for follow-up. And I'd like to have them, if it's, if it's a neck or back issue, I want them to go see an orthopedic. If they suffered a concussion because they hit their head on the steering wheel or on the side of the car, if it was a, a T-bone type accident, I want them to go see a neurologist for post-concussion syndrome evaluation. You have a right to get checked out. As I said before, you only have one body in this life. You have to get care of it. What are the key steps in the legal process? To begin with, there's filing the claim or notifying the insurance company that there's a claim against their driver and themselves. The next thing is gathering the evidence, uh, making sure that we can prove that the other party is at fault and that our party is not negligent or that the other party is mostly negligent. Illinois is what we call a comparative negligent state, which means if you are less than 50% negligent for your accident, you still collect, actually 50-50. So if you're equally at fault, you still can collect against the other guy, but the amount of your damages are reduced by the, what's called comparative negligence, the amount of negligence attributed to you. Most of the time, that's just a negotiating ploy that the insurance adjuster uses to try and bring down the value of the claim. Uh, when I'm negotiating with an adjuster, I refuse to accept those arguments because I say to them, it's not percentages that's gonna settle this case, it's dollars and cents. Right. But getting back to the original question of what are the steps, we initially file the claim, we make sure that our client gets the right treatment. We can't really start to negotiate the case in terms of personal injury until they're done treating and that we know that they're not gonna need significant treatment going forward. Or in more catastrophic cases, we know that they're gonna need treatment for the rest of their life. Start with that. Then once you have a handle on what the damages for your client will be, you can start to negotiate. And what we do is we order all the medical records for treatment up to that time. We get a, their time away from work substantiated and documented. And we package all these materials and we send them to the insurance company. We give the insurance company some time to digest uh, all the records and, and the amounts of, of the bills. And then we start to negotiate with the insurance company. If we're able to resolve the case, then the case will be, be near over. If we're not able to resolve the case, that's when the litigation process starts. And that gets started by the filing of a lawsuit. So how often does a case involve other legal services or business services to obtain an optimal result? Well, sometimes you have to hire an expert witness, a point that's something that you're treating doctors cannot help you with, or treating doctors sometimes don't want to give an opinion about the nature of the injury and how, what the future medical will be. So you have to get an expert. You may need to hire an investigator to go and take, go look for witnesses and get witness statements. You also involve court reporters if you're in litigation and you take a deposition and the court reporter has to record what the statements from the parties are and you get a transcript so that if at trial, the witness changes their testimony, you can do what's called impeachment, which is different from the impeachment that's going on today. Impeachment in the legal sense means casting doubts on someone's credibility. And that's like at a deposition, they may testify the light was red for, for them and that they ran it. And when it gets to trial, they go, no, the light was yellow when I entered the intersection and that I had a right to go through the intersection like that. Well, then you bring out the transcript and you say to them, well, do you remember giving the testimony at a deposition and you swore to God to tell the truth? And did it, you, were you asked this question and did you give this answer? And then you read them the question and the answer, whatever that might be, you make them look silly in front of a jury or a judge if it's just a bench trial. This is where you challenge credibility? Yes. Got it. And then you save that, you also save that for argument uh, at the end of the case during your summation or because I'm a plaintiff's lawyer, at the end of the case, before the jury gets instructions from the judge, 
we give an opening summation, the defendant gets to give an argument, and then we get to give what's called a rebuttal argument, showing uh, where their argument is flawed and reemphasizing our strong points. So how do you know when all of this is done so the individuals can move on? As in when the case is over? Yeah. Usually that's when we receive the check <laughs> from the <laughs> company. Sometimes there's outstanding bills that the client is not aware of. So we, we get the settlement funds, we put into a trust account. And from the trust account, we issue checks to, to like the health insurance company to pay them back. They don't get paid back dollar for dollar. And that's the other thing that the lawyer does for the client is negotiates outstanding bills and outstanding uh, subrogation interest that the health insurance company has. Um, once all these checks are written and sent out to these people, then the case is over, hopefully. Right, <laughs> so, so you have the distribution of monies and remedies and then as far as any legal issues, those are all resolved at the close of the case? Correct. I have what's called a closing statement, which is a lot less complicated than a closing statement in a real estate deal. But I also have a what's called a disbursement meeting, which is where you have the client sign the release from the insurance company. You have them sign the settlement draft. And then that settlement draft is usually made out to the client and to the law firm. That goes into the trust account. From the trust account, we issue those various checks that I spoke of. And then we wait 30 days before I close the file and I send a thank you letter to the client. Um, oftentimes a year or two later, you might see a bill crop up from um, a pathology uh, service that was issued at the emergency room uh, because they didn't get the health insurance information. And that's something that I, continue to take care of for the client. And I tell the client that I will negotiate any of these outstanding things that crop up at no additional fee. That's just part of my practice. I don't know what other lawyers do about that. That's great. That's really good to know. So going to court is not inexpensive and it can be very time consuming. Are there things that folks can do to avoid going down this path to begin with? The question is whether or not there's going to be a settlement offer. If there's a settlement offer and the client likes it, then we accept the settlement and we're done. And we accept going through those other uh, procedures that I just spoke about. But sometimes you don't have a choice. What if the other side sticks to their guns and says, no, your client ran a red light. I did not run a red light. Your client's the reason for the accident. You either fold up your tent and go home or you file a lawsuit and let 12 people decide who's right and who's wrong. That's the beauty of the system that we have in this country is that civil disputes get settled by a neutral party. And I've always liked the jury's trial system. It's what I always wanted to do since I was seven years old. There are sometimes when people put themselves in the path of harm, so to speak, and they go down this way because they really weren't thinking about just how complex their lives could get. Same thing for institutions. Sometimes they can do things that get them into hot water. And it's like, there were things they probably could have done that they haven't. In my practice, there's two things. One is don't get into an accident, which unfortunately you sometimes can't control. Or if you want to avoid a long drawn out process is to accept what we call short money, taking less than what your case is worth. Aside from that, I tell people it's going to take six months to a year before I know whether or not we have to litigate the case. This is not a, a turnkey operation in my practice. It's a lot, we let people know right at the beginning that they have to be patient. Right. Can't even start to negotiate till they're done treating. A lot of times people are like, well, something happened. We go to the lawyers. It's like, we don't even know what we got yet. Right. Um, there are occasions where people get into an accident even before they've been to a, a private doctor for follow-up treatment, the insurance company realizes that it will be cheaper for them to just pay the claim. But these are usually uh, insurance companies that don't have large limits, or it's a very obvious case where they have to pay their policy limit. Remember, a case could be worth millions of dollars or it could be worth thousands of dollars, 
but the insurance company is usually only obligated to pay the amount of insurance that someone has bought, purchased from them. We call that limits of liability, and it's clearly delineated in the insurance policy declaration page. So if a person ends up with injuries, let's say million dollars of um, remedy in terms of health care and otherwise, and their insurance policy personal is only, let's say, $250,000, they're on the hook for the 750 unless the other person, if that's a, a second party, has an insurance policy that covers it. Your insurance policy has various levels of coverage and various types of coverage. There's the liability, there's collision, there's towing, there's rental, there's med pay. And very few people realize that they're paying a premium for med pay. And oftentimes that's only $5,000. But again, when we talked about the health insurance wanting to get paid back at the end of the case, your auto company will want to get paid back two thirds of the med pay coverage that they extend for you. But in the example of someone getting hurt uh, significantly by somebody without adequate insurance, you can take that policy and then you turn around and look at your own policy to see if you have what's called underinsured motorist protection. And that should be in the same limits as your liability coverage. So that essentially your company is standing in the shoes of the guy who hit you to help make you whole again. Right. So that's in the case of an auto accident. What if it's injury on a job? Workers' comp is a completely different uh, coverage issue. Uh, in workers' comp, the three basic things are clients don't pay anything for their medical. 100% of the medical is paid by the workers' comp insurance company. There's no copay, there's no deductible, there's no balance billing, there's no out of pocket to the injured worker. The second thing that the injured worker gets is that while they're unable to work, they're entitled to disability benefits from the workers' comp insurance company, which is two thirds of their average weekly wage. Oftentimes that's about what people would be netting. The term for that is called temporary total disability. One of the few things in the law that makes sense because for a temporary period of time, the injured worker is totally disabled from going back to work. And there, that has to be paid or should be paid, I should say, up until the time the injured worker is ready to go back to work. Then the third thing that they're entitled to receive is called a permanency award. And that is something that's negotiated or it's a, an award by an arbitration trial. Got it. Very interesting. Barry, I feel like I have five more questions, but I'm just going to ask you one <laughs> more question for now, okay. which is, you know, is there a problem that you see often that people don't even know exists in personal injury cases? Yes. As I was referring to earlier, um, if you get hit by somebody who doesn't have insurance, you have what's called an uninsured motorist claim, and your insurance company stands in the shoes of the, of the uninsured driver. Now it's against the law to not have insurance, but given these times of difficulty, there are a lot of people who have let their auto insurance policies lapse because they've got other, what they feel are more important expenses that they have to pay, like rent and food for their kids. Understandable, but People should have very high limits, if they can afford it, of liability. I suggest people should have a minimum of 250000 over 500000 on their policy. And that's 250000 per person or 500000 for the entire accident, which means like if three people get injured by one person, by the bad driver, and that bad driver has a policy with 250 over 500,000 in coverage. That means those three people, if they're seriously injured, will have to split up 500,000. Or if it's a single person in the car, the most that they can get from that guy's insurance company is 250,000, which is why I like people to have bigger limits. And also I like people, I would prefer if people had what's called an umbrella policy or an excess insurance coverage. But the thing that you have to be sure of is that the excess insurance coverage will apply to an uninsured motorist or an underinsured motorist claim. 
I had a tragic case where a 80 year old woman was rear ended by a, a woman with who was drunk and who only had a minimum insurance policy. Her bills were over two hundred thousand dollars. The minimum insurance policy was twenty five thousand. That insurance company wisely just tendered that policy. My client had a two hundred fifty thousand over five hundred thousand dollars underinsured coverage as well. She also had a, a umbrella policy for a million dollars, but the umbrella policy did not apply to underinsurance motorist claims. So all I could get for her was two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and we litigated this issue because. In the years before this accident happened, this same insurance company's umbrella policies would apply to those types of losses, but they changed the policy and didn't tell her, and she wasn't grandfathered in. So we litigated that. These are some sad things that I see, and this is something that people don't know about an insurance policy. Uh, MedPay is something they don't know about, uninsured or underinsured motorist coverage. These are important things and you have to have limits for these things. You don't wanna get hit by anybody who has less coverage than you personally have in case what you did to somebody else. It's hard to now, find that, that combination. It, it is, um, but I've seen it too often. If people had adequate insurance, I think I'd be uh, doing this uh, interview from a beach. Lots of things have been changing in our world recently. And I think for quite a while, what changes have you seen in law, in the court, and in client representation over time? One of the things that I've seen is that insurance companies are not accepting the bill that the hospital gives to the client. The insurance companies want to only negotiate based on the bill after health insurance has paid it, which is, again, unfair because people have to pay back health insurance out of the settlement proceeds. The other thing is, is that the diagnostic testing that goes on now is very, very expensive, and it really runs up the cost of the emergency room treatment. The cost for these CAT scans and MRIs are anywhere from $600 to three or $4,000. You see this on the bill. Health insurance has a, a contract with the hospital and pays a different amount, but the insurance companies only want to use the amount that the health insurance pays even though the person still has to pay back health insurance. The other thing I'm seeing is that insurance companies are getting more and more stingy. They've always been stingy, but they're even getting more stingy. Uh, there's a couple of insurance companies that use a computer program uh, that's been called Colossus, and they use that to determine the value of the claim. And that's, all the, and that's the offer that they make. And if it's not accepted, they say file a lawsuit, but that's one of the changes that I've seen. A recent change that I've seen just this past week that is to the great benefit of injured parties is Illinois is now joining the ranks of requiring pre-judgment interest on a verdict so that if the case doesn't settle and the case gets goes to trial and there's a verdict, there's going to be 9% tacked on from the date of the claim to the date they pay the claim. That is a gun to the head for the insurance companies to stop playing games at the beginning. And it will hasten the settlement of a lot of cases going forward. And this just got passed the Illinois legislature this past week. Governor hasn't signed it yet, but if he signs it, insurance companies are gonna to have to deal a lot more fairly with injured parties. That's long overdue. Amen. So while you're seeing, you know, these changes happening, how has your practice evolved to keep pace with these changes and, and stay on top of these new laws? A long time ago, I was a public defender. And one of my mentors was the great James Doherty. And Doherty said that if the earth lost oxygen, lawyers would be the first of our species to develop gills. We <laughs> adapt. We have to adapt. Whatever, ha whatever gets thrown to us, we adapt, whether it means getting better software or utilizing like utilizing Google to look at accident scenes, uh, things like that. There are so many topics that you've covered. I think it'd be great to have you back again. Um, but in the meantime, it's been great to have you today. The information and guidance has been very helpful. And 
Uh, we appreciate your expertise, and then we know our listeners will find it equally useful. Thank you. I was happy to, to participate, and I'll be happy to join in any conference again. So if folks want to get in touch with you, how can they best reach you? We have, my email is bsilver at barrysilverlaw.com. My website is barrysilverlaw.com. Uh, my phone number is 847-480-2070, and we're Great. available. And if we're not there, there's a voicemail. Perfect. Thanks for watching this week's episode of Ask the Experts. I'm your co-host, Jeffrey Walk. And I'm Elizabeth Finlayson. Don't forget to send us your questions, suggestions, or ideas. As always, you can reach us at askthexperts at gmail.com. Have a productive week. Have a productive week.